Hi, and welcome to Kidney Plugged In. March is Kidney Health Month, and on today's show, we introduce you to Alexis Mackay Dunn, a mother of two young children who was first diagnosed with kidney disease in August of 2018, and which took a dramatic downturn following the birth of her second child in December. Alexis and her husband, Rob, sat down to share their story of love and hope. So stay with us because you'll meet them next, right here on Kidney Plugged In. Rob and I had just gotten married and tried to start our family. I was fortunate to get pregnant and was doing my regular visits to the doctor during my pregnancy. And um, we noticed, discovered that I had protein in my urine um, during those sort of routine checks. And the doctor sort of raised the flag, like, you know, this is something we should be looking into. I'm not sure why you have this oh, so early in a pregnancy. So uh, she sent us over to Women's Hospital to internal medicine there to see if they could determine what was going on with me and why that was presenting. And the internal medicine doctor there pretty immediately had determined that it was a kidney disease that I had. So we found out when I was about five months pregnant we got that news, which was a beautiful sunny day in the summer. <laughs> and Rob and I just didn't know what hit us. I certainly didn't know what hit me. So we decided to investigate further. We were given the option if we wanted to do the biopsy then or wait until we had the baby. And both of us just decided that we couldn't sit on that and not know what was happening. So we did a biopsy while I was pregnant. And that came back unequivocally that I had the IgA nephropathy. This disease is just completely silent and um, it's usually too late before people find out that they even have kidney disease. So we are fortunate that we that we got pregnant and we found this. Um, I think we're very thankful. Not the news that you want to hear, but we're thankful that we heard it when we did. Be something that we never forget. Um, it was a darkness and wondering, you know, what is to be. It was completely unknown to us. Tendency is to just go out and Google everything you can find about this new condition that you're learning about. But we really had to stay in the moment and remind ourselves that Allie was still not symptomatic at all. Um, healthy, active. You know, I had trouble keeping up with Allie throughout getting engaged and getting married and even during the, that first pregnancy. There's just no signs to, to see um, that there could have been anything um, other than a healthy, active, soon-to-be young mom. In that way, it was kind of peculiar because you now know that your partner is not well and has a questionable roadmap future as far as their health goes, but you're also anxiously waiting for your firstborn. And our tension kind of shifted back towards the, the pregnancy because everything otherwise had, had been well with Allie. So we, we immediately kind of wanted to work with um, our doctors to make sure that not only Allie was safe and healthy, but obviously um, the birth of our son was healthy as well. Yes, we've steady seen a decrease. Earlier, like 2018, the decrease was not as significant as it has been in the last year and a half. 
um, but it was always a couple of points down, a couple point down. Um, yeah. Um, when you're caught up in, um, you know, the exhaustion of preparing for your firstborn, and then obviously coming home with a firstborn, as well as seeing your partner who appears to be fully healthy and, and energetic, you know, it's not that you ever forget the disease, but it is, it does play a trick on you. It is ticking away. You're not quite sure how fast or at what rate, but you know it's ticking. And so it was always top of mind, but when you're a young family, it's very easy to get caught up in the moment of the day as opposed to what the roadmap for health is moving forward. I think with something like kidney disease, it's challenging because again, like it's invisible. So even telling family and friends about it, it's like they hear you and they're like, oh, that's, you know, that, that sounds terrible and kidney disease, ugh, what do you, you know? But I look the same, I sound the same, my lifestyle's the same. So it's, you know, they don't, it's hard to, for people to understand. And at that time, we were still talking in the, you know, eight, 10, 12 year timeline potentially of needing the, the dialysis or the, the more interventionist help like a, uh, like a donation. At that point, um, I'm still remembering fall of 2018, Alexis was working. She was doing site visits with her design business. I remember um, you joining me at a number of Christmas parties that year with a big healthy belly. Um, just full of joy and nobody would have known the otherwise. It was one of those things that um, we knew we would need to manage, but didn't understand how quickly we might need to manage it. We were given a window uh, in early 2020. We were given six months to try for number two, and then we're told that that was going to be sort of put on the back burner for us um, if we weren't successful in that time. So fortunately for us, we were successful, but unfortunately, in that time of success, uh, I had lost quite a bit of kidney function. Um, in those few months. So we were pregnant uh, with bated breath on how my kidneys were gonna do. We were quite, you know, um, confident that if we were able to make that window that all signs were that it would be another safe and healthy pregnancy. Unfortunately, what we didn't know was how awful 2020 is to everybody <laughs> on all things. And not only uh, did COVID hit us in March, but during the time where Allie and I were trying for number two, her kidneys started to deteriorate at a, qu at a quicker rate. And by the time we found out about that, we had already found out that we were successful with getting pregnant. So that kind of put us on a, a, a different course for pregnancy number two, and certainly constant, constant um, support and coaching from the nephrologist, uh, the uh, OB, internal medicine at women's, uh, a whole team came together to um, try and uh, manage what could be a very difficult um, pregnancy as best as possible. Hey honey, I lost the list for Jason's birthday thing. Obviously hamburger cakes. <laughs> no, not hamburger cakes. Hamburgers and cake. <laughs> <laughs> and buns. Uh, sausage. Talking. Ooh, eye candy. Is it a full moon tonight? People are being weird. And uh, don't forget to make the Facebook event private this time. Can you imagine losing most of something without realizing it? 
Over time, kidney disease can destroy up to 80% of kidney function before you notice any symptoms. Talk to your family doctor to see if you're at risk and need to be screened. It could save your life. COVID-19 is probably, uh, I'm, I'm an extrovert, I am a doer, I like to go places, and COVID-19, on top of being pregnant, was like being in jail for me. We were very diligent from the very get-go. Rob, Rob was very well read on COVID, probably over-read on COVID, and uh, I think we were wearing masks before masks were even a thing. And I thought Rob was crazy, and <laughs> but I abided. Um, yeah, and so we have been, you know, for a year now, I had a very tight bubble going out is a thing of the past. Uh, virtual visits, and then we also, um, Rob, wasn't able to attend a lot of my medical appointments. So that was hard for me because A, I'm now having to relay information as a pregnant lady is a challenge in itself because you have no brain. <laughs> so trying to remember what I've been told and just not having your support person with you, um, it, was, it was tough and I think not knowing the status of my kidney disease or like what news am I going to hear today or you know it was very stressful for me and for Rob too you know sitting in the car in the parking lot wondering what did she hear today you know is she going to be in tears when she comes out again yeah you know lots of stages through this adventure that you know I felt pretty helpless I'd give anything for this to have happened to me and not to Alexis you know I would have much preferred and I still much prefer to have taken this on COVID's added just an extra layer on top of that but there's also been significant opportunities in that as well you know there's been lots of times where um, the doctors have you know called us on conference calls and do zoom meetings with so that I can be included. I think the most remarkable um, thing that I noticed during the process, especially as we were getting further along in the second pregnancy, was that all of Allie's six or eight doctors were meeting um, every couple of weeks on a morning Zoom meeting just to talk about her health and, and the health of the baby. And when I look back at pre-COVID, I don't necessarily believe that they would have been able to coordinate their schedules. So they would have been all in the same place that way. So I think there's, you know, there's been some creative innovation that's happened through uh, through the worst of COVID that hopefully continues on because it gave us this tremendous confidence to know that um, that all these health professionals were convening on a regular basis just to discuss what they were seeing every day, every week on Ali's um, results. Well, my second pregnancy, um, I was very closely monitored. Um, I think I did labs every week or every other week through the whole pre pregnancy. And then uh, we, closer to the end, like in the third trimester. The doctors all there were hoping that we would make it to 28 weeks. Um, that was our goal. And I always thought that I would make it to 36. I was very, very determined. Um, <laughs> I was like, I will beat 30, I will beat the 28 weeks. But um, so we, we were sort of close to 28 weeks. We made 28 weeks and everyone was sort of took a, took a deep breath. Um, and said, so, okay, like baby will be just totally fine. She'll be small, but she'll be totally fine. Um, and then every week from that point was just a win for us. Um, so we got to 32 and a half weeks. 
32 and 4. And I think actually having all the care and attention that we did, we actually had a, a, a beautiful birth. Because of all the expertise and, and support from Alexis's doctors, their objective was to bring it in as a controlled and safe manner as possible. And they absolutely hit the mark. They, they were trying to find that runway of making sure that Ali's health wasn't declining at a certain rate versus the baby obviously being far enough along to, to survive and thrive. And they were able to, to find that sweet spot. Um, and so it was extremely controlled induction. It actually went much more smoothly than the first <laughs> delivery, if you can believe it. Um, and Thankfully. <laughs> We were all in, in different parts of the hospital and uh, I think just a combination of um, the relief of Sloan being born and safe and healthy, but also combined with just the stress of like me not feeling great postpartum, um, Rob being torn between being with me, being with Sloan and trying to be home with Hayden that I literally hit the wall. Uh, my body just completely quit on me and um, I had done labs around Christmas time and within hours of those labs got the phone call from our nephrologist that it was time to come to St. Paul's myself because my kidneys were failing me and um, it's probably the last thing anyone wants to hear on a good day let alone on Christmas. So we didn't even, we were at uh, Women's Hospital, we didn't even have a chance to go home. Um, we just went straight to St. Paul's. Um, yeah, it was probably... It was a little surreal in the time following the delivery. Um, our little girl Sloan was kind of rolled off to NICU and I kind of went to the NICU with our daughter who at that point was weighing four pounds, 32 weeks delivery. And I was torn because obviously my wife had just come through a delivery. And so I started my kind of journey on trying to do my best to support each of them in the coming weeks. Allie was under the care of um, the kidney care unit um, at St. Paul's. Um, Sloan was battling her way and growing in the NICU at uh, Women's. And Hayden was at home with Allie's parents. And I was kind of tr in between trying to do what I could to support all of them, but all of them not as much as I would have liked. So I was, you know, trying to be with Allie, get the breast milk, <laughs> run it over to women's, get it to Sloan, um, make sure that Hayden had some dad time while um, both parents were away. We were living, you know, in a blur, a one hour by one hour blur, um, trying to keep our head above water. And we were living hour to hour by hearing how Allie's health was, um, every time a new blood pressure reading came in. Same with Sloan. Sloan was doing great, but in her own, was having some blood pressure issues, if you could believe it. Completely unrelated, but also elevated blood pressure. So, you she know. She also had a kidney, kidney uh, ultrasound, and they were worried about her kidneys at one point, and Rob and I are like, this cannot be happening. I thankfully had a private room at St. Paul's and just sitting there to being like, this is so wrong. Like everything about this, this is like Christmas holidays. I just had a baby. I have a two year old at home and I'm sitting here in the hospital room sick away from everybody. I can't even walk the halls because COVID risk is too high. Yeah, it was not, um, not, a, not a dream vacation, that's for sure. Fortunately, it, a couple days later, Ali um, stabilized and we were able to bring her home. And we were able um, then finally to all be on the North Shore for the first time. It was three weeks later after that that we were actually all at home under the same roof for the first time and Sloan was able to come home from the hospital.
Let's see, so kidney is a... These are my grandpa's kidney stones. They're very precious. Kidney is a bone in your back that helps you turn. <laughs> mm, I don't know, to be honest. They don't know kidneys are vital, do you? Get the facts at kidney.ca. Yeah, no, I'm doing everything I could to protect myself, to protect Allie, and to protect our daughter. Yes, people question sometimes the length I go to to try and keep us healthy and safe, but. You know, I was sleeping in the NICU for a week with an N95 mask on because I thought I needed to do every little thing I could to keep my family safe. So it was a real surreal time. Without Uber Eats and Skip the Dishes, we would have never survived. Um, and, uh, but uh, like, I, like we said, you know, we're living one hour to an hour, just trying to get through it as best as we could. Fortunate that I didn't need dialysis. We actually didn't realize it at the time what my labs actually were, and I think we found out maybe three weeks later um, that my labs were basically I was on the verge of kidney failure, and the conversation had been brought up that that was sort of the next step for me. Fortunately, my health improved a little bit. It's also it's a funny thing to say when you're at the end stage of a kidney disease that I'm saying my health improved. Um, it, it improved to a level where I didn't need dialysis right away. So we're very thankful for that. Um, it didn't improve to a point where I'm never going to need it. Um, I'm definitely looking down the hall at it. And that's why we're so actively looking for a donor. very fortunate the morning of December 16th to have the arrival of our, our baby girl and as the moment came near and reality started to set in the room started being flooded by more doctors and more nurses and you know that's gonna happen but you're never quite prepared for it when it happens to you and I looked around the room and um, there was ten doctors and nurses all women supporting my wife um, protecting her health at the same time, protecting the health of our new baby girl. And I was the only guy in the entire room and I had never felt more inconsequential in my entire life. I was there just to help um, prop up Alexis's leg. Um, <laughs> at this frozen leg. <laughs> my froze, uh, frozen leg um, at a time when these just experts uh, were working in this wealth fine-tuned machine to make sure that they were doing everything they could to protect the health um, and future of my wife and and uh, and also welcome our new little girl. It's something that I'll never forget um, and I'll always cherish despite how incredibly scary it was at the moment. I need a transplant and the hope is that I avoid dialysis. Um, you know, dialysis is tough on people at the best of times. I think being a young mom with two kids, um, kids kids don't sleep through the night. <laughs> so, you know, even if I could do dialysis at home, um, it's just putting another weight on Rob. And Rob's carrying 99.9% .9 of the weight right now. So <laughs> um, if we can, be successful in finding a donor and get me a transplant as soon as possible and avoid dialysis. Um, that would be a dream come true for, for us, for sure. March is Kidney Health Month. The town of Princeton, formerly known as Vermilion Forks, is celebrating in a big way. 
Fundraising events will take place to help commemorate Kidney Health Month and support the fundraising legacy of Cara Lewis. Eureka, the everything store, a staple in the Princeton community, will be the center of all the special events. There will be a 50-50 draw, several door prizes, and for a minimum donation, customers will be given a Sydney the Kidney cutout to hang in Eureka's storefront window highlighting their name or to send encouraging messages to those living with kidney disease. So if you're traveling in the Similkameen region, stop by and say hello and support the wonderful fundraising events of their dedicated group of volunteers. For further contact, reach Sandra at EurekaEverythingStore at gmail.com or Randy at randy.spensley at kidney.ca. Way to go, Princeton, the little town that did. Thanks to all the car donations made to the Kidney Car Program, the Kidney Foundation of Canada can help all these people with kidney disease. Those donations are instrumental in providing them with care and invaluable support. When you give your car to the Kidney Car Program, it will be towed for free and recycled or resold. You'll also receive a tax receipt of at least $300. To continue to improve the quality of life of thousands of patients, we need your car today. Rob and I, I guess it started with Rob and I talking about wanting to have a second kid. Um, so I forced him into that. Uh, <laughs> and let's be clear, that, that discussion started hours after number one. <laughs> anyway, so we, um, that was January 2019, I believe. We, we really got in that conversation with. No, it was, it was 2020. Sorry to interrupt, we're gonna start that one again. Oh yeah, it's 2020. I can't, I can't keep this. I just blocked 2020 out. Like I have. I think, I think we all did. I think we all want to block exist. 2020. Doesn't out. exist. Allie's dad is now texting her, and it's coming through. <laughs> That's okay. Everything was turned off except my message. Your computer. Um, so I'm just gonna try and tell him not to text ever again. <laughs> If you could give some quick advice to people who haven't been diagnosed with kidney disease about taking care of their kidney health, what would you say? Yeah, I think, I think. Get health insurance before you find out you have kidney disease. Please. <laughs> I'm worthless. <laughs> <laughs>